Okay, let's get right into the sermon for today. We're looking at Jesus' greater number eight. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to Luke chapter one. We're looking at the final week of Jesus is Greater. It's been a few weeks where we've been looking at different men in the Bible, different guys that um, their lives had impact. So let me ask you this, and uh, you can help me. Who was the first guy that we looked at? Adam. 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 Who was the next guy that we looked at? Noah. Noah. After him? Abraham. Abraham. After him? Moses. Moses. Exactly. After him? Boaz. Boaz. And then after Boaz? David. David. After David? Solomon. And today we're looking at the man that Jesus said, this is the greatest man that's ever lived. Let me show you this verse in Matthew 11, 11. So we're looking at John the Baptist. Some people call him John the Baptizer. You know, whatever you, however you want to translate this, it's John the Baptist. This man would baptize people. And this is what Jesus says about John the Baptist, who actually, by the way, was Jesus' cousin, if you didn't know that. He says this about John. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So Jesus says, no one has been born that is greater than John the Baptist. Let me give you a little bit of context about John the Baptist. So, we looked at all these guys in the Old Testament. The last one we looked at was Solomon, the king, right? After Solomon, there was another succession of kings. Then there was prophets who were speaking for God. And then if you go to your Bible to Matthew... And you go to Matthew chapter 1, and then you flip one page before that. What do you find on that page before Matthew chapter 1? You can just shout it out, that's fine. There's nothing, right? You find a blank page before Matthew chapter 1. And then you find the text there that says the New Testament. Do you know why there was nothing written on that page? Because for 400 years, after the last prophet spoke, God did not speak for 400 years, okay? God kept silent. No more prophets, no more preachers. They still had the temple, they still had the religion, but there was no more God speaking. So, uh, what happens then? An angel breaks the silence after 400 years. And that's what we're going to read today. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. So let's just get right into it. We have a lot of reading to do. This is what it says. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there's a new king in Jerusalem, in the city of God. There was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. Keep that name in mind, Zechariah. His wife was from, the, was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Keep that name in mind, Zechariah and Elizabeth, this couple. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame, according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But here's the problem. They had no children, because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. Remember another man and another couple that we saw a few weeks ago that couldn't have children, and they were already old? What was her name? Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah. They couldn't have kids. So what did they try to do to make sure they had kids? So you're paying attention. Just shout it out. That's fine. He slept with a servant girl. After his wife tells him, go have a baby with another woman. He's like, okay, we got that one. You said it, I'll do it. He had another baby. We have the same exact story here. Zechariah and Elizabeth can't have children. And instead of finding another way, they were just patient. Let's go to verse 8. When his division, so Zechariah was a priest, when his group of priests was on duty at the temple and he was serving as a priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. It was his turn to serve inside the temple. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside the temple. And look at what happened in verse 11. An angel of the Lord, so the silence breaks. 400 years of silence is over. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him Standing to the right of the altar, 12. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. So again, those stories, like I died and I went to hell for 30 minutes, or I died and I went to heaven for 5 minutes and then I came back. I don't believe it. If you were to actually see an angel, you would, it would happen with you, it would happen with Zechariah. That he was silent. He was overcome with fear. He was terrified. Let's go to verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There we go. So we start the story of John. We'll pause there in verse 13. Let me tell you what the name John means. The name John means God has been gracious to me. If you're looking for a name for one of your kids, John. There you go. That's an awesome name. Juan. Oh, and we have a Juan here, right? Juan. It means God has been gracious to me. So Juan would say amen because he has his wife pretty much. God has been very gracious to the Juan, right? 
<laughs> Amen. So Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were promised a son. 14. There will be joy, and there will be delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. There's the argument for the value of life in the womb. Or some would say it's just a cluster of cells. It's a clump of cells. It's just like a parasite in a woman's body. God would say that is a baby. And this is what happened with John. The Holy Spirit was in John since he was in the womb. What does it say in verse 16? He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. 17. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the understanding, to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. So God is saying, John the Baptist, after 400 years of silence, he will start preaching God's word. And he will prepare the way for Jesus to come on the scene. 18. How can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel. For I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. I'll just pause here, kind of an observation in 18. Zechariah says, I'm old. But he doesn't say my wife is old. He says my wife is advanced in years. It's kind of a, a tip for you husbands. Never call your wife old. She's advanced in years, okay? <laughs> Anyways, 19. The angel answered him. I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. This is a mighty angel. And I was sent to speak to you and tell you these good news. Now listen. You will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place. Why? Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled at the proper time. God's promises always come true. Even if it takes a while, it comes true. Let's go to the next one. 21. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, when he did come out, sorry, he could not speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them, and he remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. 24. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. She got pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months. And she said this, Ladies, gentlemen, I wish we can all say something like this. The Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. In that time, women who were not able to have children were considered cursed by God. Because the Bible says children are a blessing. We have a lot of babies here today. There's a baby that had to leave before the service started. I hope he comes back someday. <laughs> but babies are a blessing. This woman was unable to have babies. God blessed her. So we're looking at point number one today. John's calling. From where did God call John the Baptist? From his mother's womb. God has known you before you were born. The Bible says this, that before the foundation of the world, God knew who he was going to save. And that's why us, it's not our job to be telling people, you're saved, you're not saved. Our job is to tell them, this is how you get saved. Will you be saved? We invite people to Jesus. So let's, let me give you a couple of notes off of John the Baptist. His parents were faithful believers. Some of us did not have Christian parents. Raise your hand if you did not have a Christian household. You did not have a Christian home. Raise your hand if that was you. Okay, maybe one of the parents were, the other one was not. Okay, that was the case for me, uh, kind of. I was brought up in Sunday school. I went, I knew all the stories. I didn't know Jesus. John's parents, they were faithful. They were servants. Year after year, they would go to the temple to serve God. Waiting for one day God to hear my prayer. God to make a promise to me. They were serving God for who he was and not just what he could give. And I would ask you that. Why do you worship God? Why are you at church today? Did someone bring you against your will? Did you come because I feel guilty? I haven't been to church in a while. No one knows me at Logos. So let me just come to Logos, you know? Especially with COVID. Like, a lot of people just didn't go back to church anymore. Or did you come because you love Jesus and you want to hear his word? That was the case for his parents. They loved God for who he is, not just what he could give. His parents knew that every season was a season of faithful service. You know, I, I knew a guy who, he was going to school, getting his Bible degree to be a, a pastor someday. And I asked him, well, what are you doing now in your city? Like, right now, what are you doing while you're getting your, your degree? He said, no, I apply to a bunch of places but uh, to be a pastor, but I think I'm just going to wait, see what the Lord has for me. Isn't it kind of funny how we blame God for being lazy? For not doing anything. I'm like, come on, man. Like, while you get your degree, point. I said, oh, there's people who need Jesus on the, down the street. Let's, let's do something. And oh, I'm kind of just waiting to see what God has for me. We kind of bring God into it. They knew that they had to serve God in every season. These parents, they prayed. And the angel Gabriel tells them, God has heard your prayer. 
Let me tell you this. God hears your prayers. It's not that if I come to church and I'm a nicer person, I'm closer to God now he hears my prayer. He hears you all the time. The reason we come here is to be gathered as a people and practice for what's going to happen in heaven. In heaven, we're going to be all together singing to Jesus with more basis, I think. Let's go to verse 15. I want you to see this. Let's back up a little bit there. Luke 1, 15. And I want you to see what God has to say about John the Baptist. It says, He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink wine or beer. And all the Baptists say amen, right? He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. God chose John to do great things. This is before he was even born. He was going to fulfill the prophecy. In the Old Testament, he had said that there was going to be some guy to prepare the way for Jesus. And then John came and fulfilled that prophecy. Let's go further in Luke 1, 39-45. I want you to, read, to see this. Again, what were the names of John's parents? Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary, the Virgin Mary, which would make John what? The cousin of Jesus. And look at this. In those days, Mary, she went out and she hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted him. It's good for primos to get together. But make sure it's the good ones, you know? You know which ones you're not supposed to hang out with. They don't help. 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside of her. Moms, those of you who have become moms, isn't it wonderful to feel your baby kicking? Isn't it wonderful to know their baby's in there doing something? You know? have, you ever, have you ever sat down and thought about it? There's a living human being growing inside of me. That is a blessing. So when Elizabeth heard Mary, the baby leaped. That was John. Baby John jumps up. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she yelled out and said, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. 43. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord, the mother of Jesus, should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped inside of me. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord would fulfill would happen. So we see John's calling. That's point number one. Let's go to the next point. Number two. John's obedience. And we're going to go to Matthew 3, 1-12. Let's go ahead and read it. In those days. So... What happened with John? We see him as a baby, and then we see him as a grown man. There's a reason the Bible doesn't give us that little section of what he did as a teenager, of what he did as a little kid. Let's go ahead and read it. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness. And look at his message. Question, do you hear this message in a lot of churches today? Repent. What does that mean? That means you're a bad person. Okay, That's what John was preaching. You don't hear that in church. He was saying, you're a bad person, so stop it. Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. He is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. For pastors, it feels like that sometimes. Like you're yelling at the dirt, like you're yelling at the desert. No one's listening. That's what John was doing. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight forth. Now, let's look at this image of John. John had camel hair clothing with a leather belt around his waist. His food was bugs. This guy was eating bugs. He was that weird cousin, right, out of the field. <laughs> he was, his food was locusts, and he, he ate wild honey. The people from Jerusalem and all Judea and all of that area were going out to him. Verse 6. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. That's why they came to John, to get baptized, to show, I want to belong to God. Wash away my sins. 7. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, the religious people, they show up to John's church. And what happens? Look at what he tells them. Instead of, see, welcome, come to church for the first time. You want to take one of these little envelopes? You don't have to give tithes and offerings, all that stuff. He didn't say that. He said, you brood of vipers. He called them snakes. Now, if you're here for the first time, I'm not going to call you a snake. <laughs> you know? I'm not John. But he called them, you snakes. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't say to yourself, Oh yeah, Abraham is our father. We're good with our faith. No. I tell you, God would be able to raise up kids from the rocks if he wanted to. Ten. Now, pay attention to this. It's a little bit confusing. I'll explain it. The axe is already at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who's coming after me is more powerful than I am. 
I'm not even worthy to remove his sandals. Would you talk to Jesus that way? Some of us treat Jesus like a genie. Give me what I want, Jesus, when I want it. And John says, I'm not worthy to take off his shoes. That's what he says. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this is where our Pentecostal friends got the idea of, I'm on fire for Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. John says, I baptize you with water as a symbol of washing away your sins. But Jesus will baptize you in one of two ways. If you're a Christian, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. If you're a non-Christian, you will be sent to hell where there is fire. That's what he was talking about. This was a strong preacher. This is not a family-friendly, so to speak, preacher. Well, his shovel is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor. And this is what we see. The, sh the chaff will be burned in the fire. That never goes out. So John, now I want to talk to the guys. Okay, again, help me with my math. How many guys do we have in the building right now? Count. Including? Oh, yes, I'm going to keep Eight. Eight guys. And how many ladies do we have today? <laughs> Including myself. Come on. <laughs> Ten. All right. We have more ladies today than men? Wow. That's a first. That's a first. <laughs> Girls win what? <laughs> what do you win? <laughs> Let me talk to the guys. This is how you win. I won't talk to the ladies first. I'll talk to the gentlemen. John was a real man. Okay? We don't see a lot of those in our culture either. We see a lot of guys pretending to be men. John was a real man because he avoided being an adolescent. The reason we see John as a baby, and the next thing we see him, he's out in the wilderness preaching strong sermons, is because God wants us to see. This is the greatest man that's ever lived besides Jesus. He was a real man. Let's go talk a little bit practical. Real men declare their theology. They say, this is what I believe. I will fight for it. I will defend it. Real men declare that they will love and serve their wives. And they say, she is my wife, I will fight for her, I will defend her. Real men declare majors in college. And they'll spend 10 years trying to figure out what they want to do. If something's not working, you fix it, you go to the next one. Real men have a sense of direction. Like, and ladies, let me ask you this. It's one of the reasons that you married your husband. Hey, this guy kind of knows where he's going. I want to go with, or was it, I ask if he looks good. Yeah, he looks good now. You'll get to see him later at home. Doesn't look the same. Real men don't take shortcuts. Real men work because the Bible promised as a man, you're going to have to sweat for your money. You're going to have to work hard to get a job, to make a living. John did this. John was not a coward. And I want to show you how he was not a coward in one second. But let's look at a couple other things. John prepared the way for Jesus to arrive. That's for men and women. Your job as a Christian is to start clearing the field and make a way for the king to ride into town. That's you. How do you do that? You tell people about Jesus. You start clearing aside all the filth, all the garbage from the community. The problem here in the city, for example, we're the poorest city, we have the most people on food stamps anywhere in the country, we have a lot of people on welfare, have a lot of housing. What we don't need is more government money, we don't need more government programs, what we need is more guys in the house who stay, who take care of their families. Amen? We have this problem where, unfortunately, there's not a lot of jobs in Brownsville, so a lot of dads go to San Antonio, go to Houston, go to the oil rigs, try to get some jobs out there. I know it's hard. I know it is. But let me tell you this, John, as a warning, because you might feel tempted to leave. I knew a guy who gave up his job to be able to spend more time with his wife. That's the kind of guy you want to be. Didn't feel right at first. And that was what I do now. I don't have a job. Well, spend some more time with your wife. Enjoy it. One day you won't. It'll be a little bit harder. John was a guy who knew what he was doing. He was on a mission. As a church, I want us to start thinking on mission. Why are we here? Why has God put us here? John's message was simple but effective. Repent, believe in Jesus. Repent, believe in Jesus. Unfortunately, again, we live in this culture where it's like movies and let me get stuff to attract you to church and you know, let me put all the nice songs. We, have a, we had a pretty awesome worship time today. There's one more song at the end, so stick around. But that's not how we bring people to Jesus. We tell them the truth about who God is, what God is doing. I invite you to stay next year for Revelation. We're going to go through the whole book. We're going to read it verse by verse. And we're going to see it's not scary for Christians. But what about this angel with a million eyes on his body? That's not scary for us. But what about fire raining down from heaven? We're going to be in heaven watching it go down. 
we need to know God's purpose for his church. So his message was simple. Next, John had questions. Like some of you have questions. There was a point in John's life where he asked his disciples, I don't know. I don't know if Jesus is the Messiah because he's supposed to be the Lamb of God. He's supposed to die. He's not dying. Uh, he's supposed to set things right. Is there another one? And he literally sends his disciples, ask Jesus if you're the Messiah. And what did Jesus say? Well, tell him what I'm doing and let him make up his own mind. Being a Christian doesn't mean you don't have questions. Actually, I encourage you to ask questions. That's why we do Q&As. You ask your questions. John knew his place. There was another part of the Bible where John says, Jesus must, what, increase, and I must decrease. That should be the way we live our lives. Make much of Jesus. Make less of ourselves. You know, I always question when you see evangelista so-and-so is coming to town. Profeta so-and-so is coming to town. Worship team so-and-so is coming to town. So who's it about them? Is it about them or is it about Jesus? John knew his place. Men, you need to know your place. You're not the king of the universe. God has put you in charge of your family, but you still answer to Jesus. Women, you must submit to your husbands. God has put them over you as not the boss, as a protector. And we work together to serve Jesus. Young men, there's, a, there's several young men here today. Know your place. You're not the king of the house. You don't set the rules. Well, it's because I'm 18 now. I'm 20. Yeah, I'm 23. Yeah, you still live with your mom. <laughs> know your place. <laughs> we submit because that's what God wants. And even if you're not, even if you're a grown man, I have my own, I pay my own bills, I have my own car, we still submit to one another. The Bible says submit to one another. The Bible says consider other people more important than yourself. If we lived like that, things would look a lot different. I'll tell you this as a son. When I wanted to go out and do something, I'd be in, right? I would, I'd behave really good. Like, Dad, I want to go with my friends. Okay. Do this and that. Oh, look, look, Mom, I'm washing the dishes. Yeah, my, you know, I'm washing them. Like, you know, can I do something? <laughs> I remember my sister one time, she, uh, when she was very little, she was like 10 years old. Like, we live in North Carolina. She, <laughs> she's not going to like this story, but. Um, one time, uh, it was like 10 p.m., we were all at home watching TV, the old school, big square TVs. And then we see my sister cleaning up, Mariendo cleaning up, and it's like 10 p.m. Like, this is not right. And then after a while, she's up in Nada, she puts on nice clothes, we're like, wait, where, where's she going? It's 10 p.m., she's 10 years old, what's happening? Then all of a sudden, we hear her knock at the door. And I found those friends. It's like, uh, Dad. Can you take me to the skating rink? Like, uh, I promised them I was going to go with them. <laughs> like, you know how dads are with no shirt, just in shorts? <laughs> what? Because she kind of knew her place. She asked permission at the last minute. That doesn't count. And we ended up going. We had a good time. <laughs> so husbands, know your place. Wives, know your place. Kids, know your place. John knew his place. And John served God until the last day of his life. This is how God's men go out. So let's look at this. In Matthew 14, 3 through 12. Herod, this horrible king, he arrested John. Why did he arrest him? Well, we'll see this. He put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Four. Because John had been telling this sinful king, it's not right for you to be sleeping with your brother's wife. He didn't like that. Five. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the crowd because they thought John was a prophet. So what did John do? Here comes the king. Imagine President Trump gets invited to Lobos Baptist Church. Right? And he walks in. He's like, how are you doing? Right? He starts talking to his New York accent. That was terrible. And the first thing that he starts doing is, Donald Trump, you're on your third wife. That's enough. <laughs> you know? That's what happened to John. He told the king, you're sleeping with your brother's wife. Stop it. He didn't like it. He had him arrested. Six. When Herod's birthday came, Herodias' daughter danced before them, and it pleased Herod. So he promised with an oath to give her whatever she wanted. And prompted by her mother, because sometimes mom has terrible advice. I'll just tell you that. Sometimes. If it's not godly, biblical advice, don't listen to it, daughters. Prompted by her mother, she answered, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a silver platter. And although the king regretted it, he did. How did John die preaching God's word till the very end? Some guys die because they overdose. Some guys die because they get an STD. Some guys die on the other side of the world because they preach God's word and they don't shut up about it. John was that man. 
And ladies, I wish you would find yourself a man like that. Men, I wish you would be men like that. You wouldn't compromise God's word because it hurts my feelings. You would tell the truth even if it hurts everyone's feelings. Because at the end of the day, you're not here to please people. You're here to please God. Amen? Amen. Please God. And that was John. He preached till the very end, and they couldn't get him to shut up, so they cut off his head. That is the only way they could get him to stop talking about Jesus. So John was obedient. And let's close with this. Number three. As good as John was, he was not the Savior. They even asked him, are you the Messiah? He said, no, I'm a friend of the Messiah. Jesus is greater than John the Baptist. Let's go to Matthew 3, 13 through 17. We have it on the screen there for you, for the sake of time. Jesus came from Galilee to John the, at the Jordan River to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, Lord, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus answered him, allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. What happened at the baptism of Jesus? When Jesus was baptized, he got up out of the water. That's why baptism is not sprinkling water on your head with a priest. It's literally submerging your entire body, saying, I belong to Jesus. That's baptism. The heavens were suddenly opened, and he saw the Spirit of the Lord descending on him like a dove. 17. And a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Although John had the Spirit in him, he was just a preacher. Jesus is God. He had the Holy Spirit in him at all times because he and God are one. So let's finish with this. John was just a preacher telling people the king's coming. Jesus was that king. John said, I must decrease. I need to get out of the way. Jesus said, I am who I am. I am God. That's who Jesus is. John baptized people with water to show outer cleansing and outer repentance. But Jesus baptizes believers with the Spirit, unbelievers with fire and hell. And that's why at the very end, Jesus was able to say this in Matthew uh, 11, 11, so we can wrap up. Truly I tell you, yes, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is even greater than John. As great as John was, if you are a Christian, God says you are greater than John. He was the last of the prophets. You now are considered God's children if you have believed in Jesus and put your faith in him. So I would invite you to do that today. Put your faith in Jesus. Why? Because, my friend, you are a sinner. You're not a good person. You're not going to fix up your own life. You could change a few behaviors. You could change some of the things you look at on TV, some of the things you listen to. But only Jesus can change your heart. And that's what you need. Looks like keep going back, like the Bible says, like a dog going to their vomit, like a pig going back to the dirt. That's what we are without Jesus. We go back to the dirt. But we don't need that. We don't need to be cleaned outside. We need to be cleaned inside. So put your faith in Jesus today. Because He is greater. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for today. We thank You for our time together. And we pray that You would forgive us because some of us have been walking from You further and further away to the point where it doesn't even feel wrong anymore to walk away from You. Please give us a heart that feels. Make us humble people. Lord, let us see that You are coming back any day and we don't want to be left behind. Jesus, you came, you bled, you died for sinners like me. And when you were on the cross, you said it's finished, that you were done paying for sin once and for all. You were buried, and when you rose from the dead on the third day, because you're God, you offer to us now to apply that payment to our account. You want us to be saved, and we would just confess that, yes, we are lost. Yes, we need you. Please save somebody today, Lord. We're all still praying. We all have our you know, heads bowed and our eyes closed out of respect to the person next to us. I'm going to let you sit in this for a minute. If you're a Christian and you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, rejoice. Give thanks to God at this moment. But if you're not a Christian, or if you've lied to yourself that you are a Christian and you know you're not, take my warning. You will be baptized with fire, not in a good way. Repent. Go back to Jesus today. Ask Him to save you, and He will. Let's take a minute to just sit in that and talk to God.
Father, we thank you for letting us be here. We pray that you let us be honest with you. We pray, God, that right now as we start asking some questions, we will find answers in your word. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray for our friends who are at home, that they can't be with us. That you please bring them back safely pretty soon. We pray for Sammy and his family. We ask you all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go ahead and end the transmission there.